We are back with part two of the midterm exam review for introduction to philosophy. So this time we're going to look at the second set of questions and there are only three questions here. Um, we'll go through all of those and uh, hopefully this will help you in your efforts to write an answer. We're going to start out with question E. And again, if you choose to do so, you can choose one question from these three questions. If you decide you don't want to answer any of these, then you do have to answer one question from the other three sets of questions. Okay, question E is what are the parts of an argument and how does one critique an argument? That's the first part, which has actually two parts to it. Uh, and then, what are two ways in which empiricism attacks the argument of rationalism? I want you to explain those two attacks. Right? We're dealing with a debate between two sides, and they are pretty much die metrically opposed right they have com they completely oppose each other uh, so okay let's go back to the beginning of this what are the parts of an argument and how does one critique an argument the parts of an argument well there's two main parts there's the conclusion this is what you are trying to persuade people to accept so the conclusion is the the end point where you want to get people. After they heard your argument, the first part of your argument, they will be persuaded to accept the conclusion. So what is it that persuades us? The the other part of the argument is called your premise. So the premises to your argument. And in the premises, we know that there are um, two kinds, fundamental kinds of premises. There are facts, and then there are principles. And facts are about specific things in the world, and a principle is a more general statement. Should be giving you some notes here. So we're talking about an argument. Parts of the argument is by premises, by inferences, and by conclusions. So you can say there's three parts. Uh, the conclusion, the claim. We want someone to be rationally persuaded to accept after hearing our premises and inferences. Okay. So Conclusion that we want people to accept it's based on our premises and our inferences. Our premises uh, uh, claims that we will use to support our conclusion. Inferences are of reasoning that take us from a premise, or usually it's more than one premise, it's premises, to a conclusion. And we talked about in class how sometimes you have uh, sort of intermediary conclusions on the way to your final conclusion. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Okay, so you have premises and you have inferences, and that is what you're going to use to convince someone to accept the conclusion. If you have a problem with the conclusion, you don't attack the conclusion, you attack the argument basis for us accepting that conclusion. So you need to show that there's either a problem with one of the premises or one of the inferences. And then and then you can uh, rationally not accept the conclusion. That doesn't mean the conclusion is, is wrong. It means that this is not a convincing argument. There's problems with it and I'm not convinced. So of the premises, I was just saying this before, there's two types, fundamental types, and those are facts and principles. And facts are specific, concrete claims about the world. And principles are general, often abstract, universal claims about the world. Okay, and we can expand our sense of the world and talk about principles that govern logic. Um, we, we can we can play around with that, but. We're, we don't have to get that specific in this class. We just need to, to realize that we can make more particular claims, right? facts, concrete, these are all sort of words we can play around with when we're dealing with facts, particular claims about the world versus principles, which are more general, abstract, universal claims. Okay, so we know now that uh, the argument has this basic structure. Uh, we start with some facts or principles. We make inferences. We might have intermediary conclusions. And eventually, uh, we're going to come to a, a final conclusion. So part of this question is what are the parts, but then it says how does one critique an argument, and I've already sort of stated that. You don't critique the conclusion. You critique the things that are meant to persuade us to accept that conclusion. Premises and the inferences. Okay. So we know that there's where, if we're going to tax this argument, that's where we need to aim for. We need to find a problem with the fact or principle, show they're not true, so that was being unsound, or that there's a problem with the reason, the inferences that are made, and then you say that the, there's, the argument is invalid, or there's an invalid inference within the argument. Okay. So we know what we need to target. We know the, the structure of the argument, so the parts, and then we know what parts we need to target when we're going to critique an argument. All right, let's go look at the second part of the question. What are two ways in which empiricism attacks the argument of rationalism? All right, so these are two ways that we talked about in class. I did not come up with these. These are classic attacks. So if empiricism attacking rationalism. Now, the first thing to note, and you should probably put this in your paper, is that rationalism, the kind of inferences, the type of reasoning that rationalism uses is deduction. And so deduction goes from a, a general claim, an inclusive claim, and then from within that broad range makes a more particular claim that's already a part of the general claim. So if the general claim is true, the anything you deduce would have to also be true. So it's, it's a form of reasoning that 
is really something we can't can't really argue against or pick apart. Uh, when you use deduction from a true premise, you should always get a true conclusion. So, the empiricist has a problem. And it's going to be a lot harder to attack deduction, the inferences. So what's that other part we can attack? The premises. So we're going to have two attacks against the premises. All right, let's do a first attack on the premises of the rationalist. And let me think for a second. What did we say that first talk was about? Uh, okay. So the first attack has to do with the fact that a first principle has nothing behind it. Right? That the rationalist start with a priori, we learned that word, first principles. Before a priori meant <clears throat> was shorthand in Latin for before experience. Which means a rationalist cannot use anything from experience to justify a first principle. A starting point to all their arguments. <coughs> so, if that is the case, and it's a first principle, so there's no other principles that a rationalist might hold to support or justify the truth of that principle, then the first principles of a rationalist have nothing to defend them. And in an argument, we are asked to uh, judge the truth of the premises, whether they be pr principles or facts. We can accept an argument that is based on anything false. And if we're not sure whether something is true or false, that weakens the argument. Uh, and you'd be completely reasonable to say, I'm not going to accept the conclusion until we know whether or not this is actually true or false. So, okay, the first principle has nothing to support it, and yet the rationalist is asking us to accept that these first principles, that everything else is based on, are true. Uh, they might say, well, it's just obvious that this is a law of the universe. And the empiricist could say back, well, it's not obvious to me. It's not something that uh, I find to you know, just something that's just revealed for experience. Uh, in fact, the, the empiricists believe that you start with a blank slate. There are There is no knowledge when you start. There are no principles that you have before experience. So it's hard for them to accept that, that there might be any of these principles. And the rationalists with their first principles were not able to offer any reasons for why these first principles are true. So the empiricist is going to then argue that the rationalist is being irrational. It's irrational to accept something as true without reason. So Rationalist is acting irrational in asking someone or themselves to accept something 
without any reason at all. Okay. So this first attack is that the rationalist is irrational, let's say. And, uh, and this is a problem. Okay. Again, this is not the end. There's going to be counter arguments and big debates over this, but this is a pretty harsh critique. Okay, what's the second attack? The second attack on rationalism. So here, uh, we, we studied that rationalism uh, argues that these these first principles are that that we have them before experience they're a priori, and the empiricist is going to say perhaps they're not a priori. So perhaps these a priori first principles are not. A priori. If they're not a priori, so not before experience, then they'd be after experience. So this should mean the first principles are actually not first and arise from experience. Right, so how does the empiricist do that? Well, they don't actually prove definitively. Uh, they just have. They just want to argue that it's possible that this is the case. And if it's possible that this is the case, it's then possible that the that there's a big problem with rationalism it's argument. And then uh, we can reasonably uh, say, until this is resolved, I can't accept your conclusion. Alright, so how does the empiricist raise the possibility uh, of, of this? Well, they, they argue that we, we can't test a newborn to ask them what are the first principles. And it takes a, a long time for a newborn to develop and gain language to get to a point where they're able to talk about principles, rules, laws that govern the, the world. So, uh, and also that much of our early years, we have no memory of them. It becomes this big black hole in our, our childhood. And, and that's true for everybody, right? No one remembers, you know, what happened, what they were doing when they were one years old. No one I know can tell you what they were doing when they were one year, two months, and three days old, and you know, how that morning went. Uh, much, much of our childhood disappears on us. So the empiricist is going to argue it, it's it's possible that some of these first principles, or all of them, actually could have been things that we abstracted uh, and that we used induction from all the different experiences we had during those early years and that we don't remember going through that process. Uh, so if, if this is possible, and it seems possible, then what does this mean for the rationalist? Well, it means that the empiricist has successfully undermined rationalism itself and that these rationalists are actually empiricists that have just forgotten the, these processes that happened during their childhood. Uh, so this is another really strong attack against rationalism. And again, rationalism is, is going to try to respond and they're going to try to use uh, science in some ways to try to argue the case. 
there's lots of actual experiments with newborns to see if they have uh, you know a priori principles just built in to the mind uh, so it's not the end but this is a really strong argument I think and, and there's a lot there for it uh, it's definitely a difficult attack to defend so uh, perhaps rationals actually did not have any, any prior interaction. Principles between the lines and over the years of our uh, earliest over the earliest years of our childhood. We um, collected many different experiences, and we inferred basic principles from those experiences. Okay, if this is true. Then the rationalist will actually be a empiricist. Okay. Uh, if we take this 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 deeper, uh, what's going on with the these attacks on on rationalism from empiricism? It's heading towards dogmatism that the rationalist is accepting certain things without questioning uh, that these first principles are just true and we can't question them there's nothing to question there's no way to prove them they there's nothing before them so uh, that's the danger of any rationalism is that it becomes a dogmatism and the danger of any dogmatism is that people stop thinking right? and that people start to accept things without question that are actually wrong and uh and that's 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 a big danger to rationalism uh and this this dogmatic side to it okay um and, and that doesn't mean dogmatism is always bad uh, G.W. Foote, we talked about before. Your, your childhood is very dogmatic. And it, it, it needs to be that way. You need to sort of just download beliefs before you can question your beliefs. You need to have beliefs, right? So, uh, in some ways, dogmatism has its place and it's really important. Uh, it's really important to be dogmatic sometimes during an emergency uh, where you don't have time to go out and test things and collect data and so it makes a lot of sense to be dogmatic to find authorities and the best authorities you can find and just dogmatically accept what they're saying for the time being at least during an emergency uh, that's a very smart strategy okay so that basically now we've done question e and uh we're actually at a great spot right now because it's about to be time for a commercial break. And uh, this, this first commercial is incredible. Uh, you're going to see something just a miracle. You will not believe this. And uh, I'm so glad that you're going to have an opportunity to catch this. And uh, it starts now. Hello. I want to show you something that will really shock you. This is a plain white shirt of mine. And this is the new Papermate pen. Now watch this. Looks like I'm ruining a good white shirt, doesn't it? Now watch. Now look. 
Here's bar of soap, and here's water. There, you can see for yourself. There's not a trace of ink anywhere. Wasn't that amazing? Now I'm really gonna show you something about this paper mate ink. Paper made ink is absolutely permanent on paper. How about that? Paper made ink washes right out of cloth and yet is permanent on paper. Is it any wonder that paper made is the pen approved by bankers and school principals all over the country? Look for this display wherever pens are sold. The new paper mate with the exclusive silvered tip still costs only $1.69. Refills in four ink colors are only 49 cents, so insist on genuine Papermate pens and refills. Okay, well, uh, now you guys have something to do. Uh, grab all your pens, write on all your shirts, and see which pens uh, the ink will wash out. And you stick it into a little bowl of water and get some hand soap. And then try it out on paper and see how that works. Um, see how it goes. Okay, uh, we did question E before, now we are on question F. And question F is kind of the uh, sister question to question E. Uh, so you should, you should already know what it says. But let's just take a look, we'll read it. What are the parts of an argument and how does one critique an argument? The same exact question that was asked in E. And then we have the exact reverse of the, in the second part. Reverse. All right, it's too late for me to figure out the precise word, the obverse, something like that. Okay, what are two ways in which rationalism attacks the argument of empiricism. Explain. Aha. Uh -huh. So now we're looking at rationalism's attack, or the rationalist's attack on the empiricists. And these are their arguments. So everything I said before about the structure of an argument and what part of the argument you will attack it holds for this question. We just repeat all that in the answer in the first part. And then we move on to the second part. So I'll say uh, same as before. The structure of the argument and what part to target when critiquing. Okay, so let's get to the next part. The next part are the two ways in which rationalism attacks empiricism. So the first attack in, I can't remember what order I went in class, so I just, in order, it doesn't matter. Uh, the first attack, I'm going to say, is going to be on the inferences of empiricism. So why is this the first attack? Well, because I think rationalists are pretty happy about themselves that they are able to attack the inferences of empiricism because the empiricists were not able to attack the rationalists method of reasoning, deduction is rock solid. But the kind of inferences that empiricism uses, we said was induction. Empiricism relies first and foremost on induction as their method of reasoning. And induction happens to be the way that all science reasons. You collect a bunch of specific facts, data, 
and then you look at all that data and you see if there's anything you any generalizations you can make any patterns that you find any correlations you find that stay consistent and then you make a general claim a general rule uh, about the laws that govern things in the world okay so what do they have to say about induction and science what's wrong with this form of reasoning well if you think about induction you collect a certain amount of data but the collection of data is always going to be finite so the collection of data is always at some point you stop and you look at your data and you can it's fine you can always count it up this is this these are how many experiments i ran these are how many test subjects were, were there these are how many people i i, I interviewed or surveyed it's always finite but the conclusion in being general and being universal is something that's infinite will hold for all our evidence to support a claim that governs all are just this finite collection of examples and the empiricist says that's that's not really enough to justify a general claim a universal claim about the world that you know something about the world uh, in this most fundamental way. So, we call this a fallacy, right? A fallacious way of reasoning, of trying to persuade someone to accept a conclusion. So, induction makes a universal claim based on a limited amount of support this method of reasoning lines up directly with the fallacy we learned about called hasty generalization And here the argument is that there will always be hasty. We always don't have enough data to justify making a universal claim. And so this undermines any attempt to use induction. Uh, that it's something that is is uh, dangerous because it could be wrong okay uh empiricism is not going to accept this they're going to attack back but this is actually a very strong argument against this form of reasoning that uh that it is hasty that things could always be different if you just did a little bit more research you might find out that uh the patterns you saw before don't hold and you would have made a bad conclusion if if you had just worked with just that limited set of data. And, and you see this in science, they're always trying to, to gain more data to have other people run those experiments. Um, right? There's there's sort of this paranoia in science, a real paranoia, and it's for this reason that you never know if uh, you have enough data to truly uh, be able to fully rely on your conclusions okay so first attack is on the method of reasoning right? induction and uh, the second attack okay, so we have one attack on the method of reasoning the inference the second attack is on the premises 
of empiricism. And so here, we have to think about what is the premise. What are the, the first premises of empiricism? Well, it's our facts about the world. How do we know those facts? We know them through our senses. So the first facts of empir any empirical argument are known through the senses. Right? The five senses. And the rationalist is going to point out that you know, we're often mistaken in what we see or hear or smell. Um, it happens a lot. And sometimes it happens when we're absolutely positive we, so we see somebody and we're, we're not even that far away from them. And then it turns out they're completely someone different. So even when we're really sure about something that we see or hear, uh, we find out we were mistaken. And even worse than that, sometimes we have dreams that are so real that everything that's happening in that dream seems to be real. And then it turns out we were all wrong. We weren't just wrong about a little thing. We were wrong about the whole thing. So if our senses are so unreliable sometimes, even when we're just sure about things, it turns out they're, they're sometimes unreliable, then how can we really be confident in any argument at all that the empiricist makes? So I'm going to put this down to the first facts. We're going to the senses. Our senses are often mistaken. Even when we are highly confident in something, we sometimes discover we were mistaken. Um, sometimes in dreams, we appear to be. Experiencing the entire world, and it is all illusion. Okay, so the, the crux of the argument is that. We can't completely rely on anything from our senses unless we can't rely completely on any argument made by an empiricist. Okay, so what's happening here? Well, just as I said, the empiricist was, was leading us down a road with rationalism towards dogmatism, and that that could lead to just blind, fo blindly following uh, someone who is wrong. With the arguments of the rationalists against the empiricist, we're being pushed towards skepticism that we can't know anything, right? If, if the empiricist form of reasoning can't be relied on, can't give us, give us knowledge, that we can really be confident and say, yes, I know this, because knowledge seems, an aspect of that seems to be confidence. And if we can't have that confidence due to how the empiricist reasons, and we can't have that confidence uh, because 
the way in which we collect our facts is uh, we call this fallible, right? In the sense is it's a fallibility problem that uh, even when we're highly confident, we can be wrong with our senses. Um, so if the empiricist uh, can't claim knowledge then, because they can't be confident in anything they claim. They, they never seem to stand on solid ground. And that's skepticism, right? They're, they're, you're, you're constantly, everything below you is crumbling away. Now the danger of skepticism, so like dogmatism led to this blind following of you know, falsehoods. The danger in skepticism is complete ignorance, just giving up on knowledge, giving up on truth, and living in complete ignorance. That's the danger of skepticism. Uh, okay, so uh, we're, we're in this awful, or at least William James in the book, we're in this awful predicament where we could slide into either dogmatism or skepticism, and we face a real threat of blindly following falsehoods or living in complete ignorance. Uh, this, is, this is the predicament that William James thinks we, we unfortunately have to face. Because if it isn't solved, then philosophy can no longer progress. We're just going to be stuck in the stalemate. Because both sides now we see have good arguments against each other. So neither side has is being persuaded to say I'm wrong and to accept the the other side. Okay. Uh, well, it turns out uh, we answered this question. And uh, it's time for another commercial break. And uh, I'm really excited about this next one because it's all about uh, being inspired to do some writing. And probably uh, you all need that to, to finish your midterm. Um, and, and sometimes what, what's going to do that, what's going to give you the inspiration is other tools. That, that we have to work with. Now from Leave It to Beaver to Leave It to Remington. Isn't that the greatest? Imagine the drama club doing my plays. Gosh, Amy, how'd you ever get started? Oh, one day my quiet writer and I got together and suddenly, inspiration. Ah, oh, you know, it is the greatest. The way a Remington quiet writer helps stimulate interest in the young people, brings out the best in them. You know something, the minute you get your hands on this wonderful portable, you find yourself with an urge to express yourself. Now that can be mighty important, not only in school, but in later life too. Now then, how do you feel that the quiet writer can bring out and do all these wonderful things? Well, in the first place, it's the only portable with the fabulous four. Four fabulous features that make typing easier, faster, and neater. One, the 88-character standard keyboard, exactly like the latest office typewriters. Two, the miracle tab. Sets and clears stops in front, makes indenting easier. Three, the large size, sure grip cylinder, so dependable you can type all the way to the bottom of your page and it won't slip. And four, the super strength frame. It helps give shock resistance for years of extra life. Only the Quiet Rider has the fabulous four, and yet it's so easy to own. You'll find Remington Portables, complete with a very handsome carrying case, available at list prices of $84.50 to $133.95. And my friends, right now is the best time to see your Remington dealer, because right now, he can make you the best deal. The down payment, only $5. After that, a dollar and a half a week, terms payable monthly, including taxes, and a small carrying charge. So I hope that you'll see your Remington dealer as soon as possible and get the young people in your family a Remington Quiet Rider. Help bring out the best in them. Oh, and by the way, next week over most of these stations, 
Leave it to Beaver will change to Wednesday nights. So I suggest that you consult your local paper for the proper time. Right now, back to Beaver. Uh, sorry, we've actually had to cancel Leave it to Beaver. And uh, we're going to be replacing it with philosophy lectures uh, pretty much permanently. Uh, but hopefully you guys all have your quiet writers. And uh, you're very excited to do your quiet writing. Uh, inspired not just to not just to write a midterm exam but maybe write a play and uh, get that thing produced on Broadway also uh, please don't forget to use your miracle tabs and uh, notice that the the fourth benefit of the miracle writer was its shock absorbers and its extra strong chassis and I think they did that because uh, they realize that people often get very frustrated when they're writing, especially philosophy midterms, and they want to be able to chuck that that uh, quiet writer across the room uh, and smash it into the wall a couple times and uh, let out a little bit of that inspiration so they can get back to writing. And wouldn't it be nice if computers uh, had that feature also, so that you know, in the midst of your writing, you could throw your laptop as hard as you wanted against the wall and its shock absorbers would take all the impact and you could then go get it, pick it off the floor, and start up again. Uh, but we lost that feature. Okay, question G. Uh, this is the last question from the second set. And uh, let's take a look. Carol Dweck, this is the psychologist uh, from Stanford that, that you studied. Carol Dweck develops a theory of mindsets. Explain Carol Dweck's theory of mindsets by detailing the two different kinds of mindsets. William James points out that many people believe there are two main attitudes in philosophy, rationalism and empiricism. How would the two mindsets of Carol Dweck map to the division between rationalism and empiricism? We will need to explain rationalism and empiricism to be able to explain why it is closer to one of the mindsets. And uh, I have to say, I think this is this is also one of these questions that's a little a little more difficult because we don't actually talk about this in class, so it's asking you to sort of go beyond class and. And I'm not sure how well this works, actually. So I, I, I like to see how students answer this question. And uh, as long as they understand all the concepts and uh, they make sense in what they're saying, I accept a lot of different answers. OK, so what are the two mindsets? Well, this is Carol Dweck's. Mindsets. We know that there is the fixed mindset and the growth mindset. The fixed mindset. Um, a lot of students have have problems with this part when they go to define it. Instead of defining what a fixed mindset is, they talk about the consequences of having a fixed mindset. And those are two, those are different things, right? consequence of something versus what it actually is. The fixed mindset is just a self-concept, an idea about the self. And the idea is that the characteristics that make up who we are are things that don't dramatically change. Right? The characteristics That define who we are do not dramatically change. We're all just different types of people. And you know, maybe it has something to do with DNA, and you are who you are. Growth mindset, on the other hand, is sort of diametrically opposed. Uh, the characteristics that 
make that fine and scale that. Let's define who we are can dramatically change over time. Right? Not all at once, but over time the the characteristics when we look at something and say these are these these this is who they are. Whatever it is you say who they are, that all can change completely to the opposite uh, over time. So fixed mindset versus growth mindset. Right? So growth mindset is going to focus more on training uh, the the effort, the time you put into something. Whereas the fixed mindset is going to focus more on uh, something like DNA, the initial coding that, that can't change. Okay. So those are fixed mindset, growth mindsets. Then we have with William James, uh, these two, he calls attitudes. Rationalism and empiricism, and we said that that's that's a different way of thinking about them than traditionally in philosophy. One thought of these two things; they were the sort of epistemological camps, positions uh, that held sort of different ideas about how how one gains knowledge and um, the starting part point of knowledge. Uh, and William James expands this to an attitude, personality, uh, a way of looking at the world. So, begins with the whole principles in here, and then moves to parts. Begin with the parts, facts, and then moves to the whole. Okay. Uh, how are we going to connect these together? Well, this seems to be quite a puzzle. Uh, so we sort of explained a little bit of rational empiricism, fixed mindset, growth mindset, uh, which seems closer to the other. Wow. One way to think of this is with rationalism, you begin with certain principles about everything. So they define everything. They set up parameters and sort of fix the laws of the universe. And so you might be able to make a case if you want to to try to connect rationalism with a fixed mindset. Now, would the empiricism then map to a growth mindset? And here, uh, you might be able to do that because in empiricism, you collect facts. And as the facts change, you will change your conclusions. And as more facts appear, uh, your initial conclusion might radically change. It might go from one side all the way to the opposite. So you might have a lot of facts in the beginning that the sun is in motion around the earth. And you've measured it. As, as you've measured how shadows move and how the sun's in different parts of the sky. And you might conclude from that that the sun is in motion. It circles across the earth, and you see it rise in the east, and you observe it setting in the west. But as you collect more and more data, you might come to a point where you conclude the exact opposite, that the sun is actually... Uh, 
relative to the solar system, it's not moving, and the planets are moving around the sun. Uh, so there's an example where uh, things are changing and can change quite dramatically. Okay, and take this a step farther. We don't we don't know who's right. Remember we talked about this debate between nature and nurture and how uh, it's not something that's resolved. Whether who we are is due to our nature, our coding, or it's due to our nurture, our education, training, experience. Um we can't definitively say one or the other. The pragmatist says, well, maybe it doesn't matter what's true. Which one is more useful to you in accomplishing your goals? So if that's the case, if we're going to take on the pragmatic um, method, the, the way of valuing and deciding, then you'd have to go with the growth mindset, right? Because the growth mindset in the long run leads to higher performance. Um, okay. But that doesn't mean that if you don't have a lot of time, that the pragmatist might also at points choose the fixed mindset. Okay. So we've gone through the three questions from set two. And uh, you'd have to pick one of these if you decide to do uh, one of your questions from this group set. Uh, the next video is going to be about set three. And that's actually going to be the last video. I'm not going to go through set four. Uh, that one only has two questions. And they're, they're kind of stories. And joke, uh, one joke, one story. And you, you're asked to sort of explain the philosophy behind the joke or the story. And I think you can, you can pretty much figure that out if you decide to do one of those from watching these other three videos. So I'm just going to do one more video. Thank you.